despite global warming, a warm welcome to all of you uh, to this workshop on water and climate justice towards the People's uh, Charter. For those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Vishwa Satka. I chair the board of the Cooperative and Policy Alternative Center uh, that is hosting you for the next uh, two days. COPEC is a 19-year-old NGO. We've been involved in the grassroots space um, for a while and have been, been busy with various initiatives on cooperatives, on solidarity economy, an eco-village, and more. Uh, we've been busy with food sovereignty campaigning, um, a co-founder of the South African Food Sovereignty Campaign, coming out of a 2014 dialogue and consultation across the country on the right to food. And in that work, we've come to understand and appreciate the importance of the drought. The drought is still with us, it's still alive, it's not over despite the end of day zero in Cape Town. As we speak, dam levels in the Eastern Cape are very, very dangerous, if you like. They had a very, very low level, okay, threatening a host of towns and cities in the Eastern Cape. So the drought is not over. This is one of the worst droughts in the history of South Africa. And in our campaigning work, we also realize that we have to connect up the dots. We have to connect up the dots between high food prices, the drought, and of course, climate change. And, and we really believe that it's really time for us to converge. And we've cast the net wide uh, to various sectors and various organizations. Organizations in the environmental justice sector and leading activists have been, have been invited to this event. And I must just register for the record that many, many are enthusiastic and committed. We received apologies from Groundwork. They have a workshop uh, right at the same time as this one. We also received apologies from Woman, uh, who also wanted to be here. We also received apologies from Patrick Bond, who's overseas received apologies from uh, David Fig, who's also uh, in another engagement. Uh, we've received um, apologies from others uh, that just couldn't make it. But the point is this, is that we wanted to make sure that all the key actors in the South African space in environmental justice are included in this conversation. We've also reached out to the unions, and we've tried to bring into the conversation the leading unions in the country. So we have NUMSA here, We've invited uh, Kusatu's think tank, Naledi, which hosted the first climate crisis conference uh, involving Naktu, Fedusa, and Kusatu. So having Naledi here is going to be very, very important. They're going to be part of this conversation. We've also invited uh, various grassroots movements and community organizations, from the Unemployed People's Movement to various others. And we've also reached out to the uh, faith-based communities. And I'm really happy that we have at least three representatives coming from there. Uh, we have Father Egan, um, and I'm really glad that he will be sharing with us, in brief, some of the positions that the Catholic Church has taken. Uh, the Pope has one of the most progressive positions, for instance, on climate change. We also have uh, other faith-based communities here as well, the Hindu sector, and of course, uh, somebody who's uh, from a traditional side of South Africa. So, we are, we are really also trying to reach students because they also, if you like, implicated in this challenge and the generational justice question is very, very important for them. And that is why we want to anchor this event here because tomorrow you'll interact with one of the most vibrant student societies at Wits University, the Inala Forum for Climate Justice and Food Sovereignty. And Inala is busy pushing this university to become the first ecocentric university in the country with zero carbon emissions, zero waste, zero hunger. So you'll get a feel for these young people, what they are doing, you'll visit their garden, you'll also be part of the launch of their communal eating space. So we've tried to connect up the dots and bring key forces together in this conversation. I think the second important point about what we're trying to do here is that we want to take stock so the drought is not over, as I said, but 
What is happening at the front lines? What is happening in terms of flashpoints? What has been our responses so far from progressive civil society, from movements, from campaigns, etc.? So we really want to, if you like, create a knowledge commons of sharing lessons, experiences, and so on. It's very likely that we are going to have another drought. And so if we are not learning lessons from this drought as progressive forces, well, we are shooting ourselves in the foot. Uh, so there's an important learning moment, and we are hoping that in this workshop for the next two days, we really make that learning moment work for all of us. The other thing that we want to achieve is that we also want to put the spotlight on government. So the South African government has positioned itself very much within the multilateral process as a firm supporter of the Paris Climate Agreement. It has now put into place a climate bill. It has put forward a new integrated resource plan, making the case for a new energy mix for the country. <coughs> We've also seen a shift in the ruling party, and we see a new regime uh, in place as well, led by Cyril Ramaphosa. So there are, there are deep questions to be asking about where the state is. How serious is the state about its commitments to climate, the climate crisis? How serious is the state in terms of pushing a deep, just transition? Now, this is a concept that is highly contested, but it comes from trade unions, and it's a concept that we cannot surrender, if you like, to the other side. So, where are we in relation to the state? What are the, if you like, progressive shifts in the state? What are the limits? What are the weaknesses? What are the gaps? And how do we, as progressive forces, contest to push the state in a particular direction. The other ob objective we want to achieve is to really put front and center the whole minerals energy complex and the whole debate about ESCOM. Now right now the narrative in South Africa is let's stop the debt spiral of ESCOM. All right? Well, for those of us who are in the climate justice space, we are saying let's stop the debt spiral of all of us. Okay? ESCOM is important, it does generate electricity and so on for the entire economy, it has a monopoly, but the challenge of climate change is something we really need to square off in our debates around ESCOM. There's also the interest of workers, and we cannot, as progressive people, as climate justice activists, forget those interests. Those interests are very, very important. And so how do we build the alliances, how do we build the relationships with workers that are stranded in coal and other kinds of fossil fuel to bring about change. And it's very, very clear the debate that's happening is that particularly government's response is a cost-cutting response, is a response just to save what they see as a very important parastatal, etc. But they are not thinking deeply. And I would argue that unions like NUMSA, etc., have a much more nuanced and a much deeper perspective. Actually, they have a socialist perspective on the deep just transition. And so we need to surface this. Mining affected communities. In Germany right now, the big debate in Germany, set, uh, there's a commission set up by the German government. It's involving the unions, it's involving mining affected communities. And they are debating the date when they will stop using coal in Germany. And they are debating strategies for mining affected communities. So again, how do you respond so that those communities are not left behind as part of the just transition. The other objective uh, that we have for our dialogue is to really explore the dynamic around, or the initiative around, a People's Climate Justice Charter for the country. Now, as I started off by saying that we come out of a campaigning process, almost four years of campaigning around the food crisis through the Food Sovereignty Campaign, uh, we've recognized the centrality of climate change, climate crisis, just transition, climate justice. Similarly, in other spaces, activists have been doing amazing work. Whether it's in the unions, whether it's environmental justice, etc. But we are not talking to each other. We might have particular platforms, we might have particular engagements, etc. But the crisis is deepening and it's worsening. And if we are not coming together, if we're not finding convergences, and not tactical convergences where we hold on to our little campaigns, 
you come and you march behind us and you go home. We need to mature our politics to a point where we have a strategic convergence, where we are saying that we need a common way forward for the country to address and tackle these problems. The time is now, comrades. If we don't start doing this, if we don't start having these conversations, if we don't start finding these intersection points, okay, the crisis is going to deepen and the forces of reaction are going to come to the fore. And you're even going to see, if you like, the further regression of democracy, both in South Africa and in the world. Uh, I'll say more about eco-fascism uh, later on in the program. So, the session tomorrow is to test an initiative that comes out of our activism, it come, comes out of our, our realization that we need this convergence, and so this year we, we launched the People's Water Charter process. But we're not wedded to this idea of a water charter. We see the problem holistically, we see it as a climate crisis problem, and that implicates everything. So there's room for us to think this through. And in this regard, I want to thank the support from the Frederick Ibbert Stiftung, because they understand the work that we are doing uh, in terms of trying to, if you like, foster this unity, bring forces together, and build the momentum, if you like, for a national platform. The climate justice movement in South Africa has to go beyond being a Google list. We have to have an active, real, living alliance at a national level. We have to have a national forum where we all come and learn from each other, share, build solidarity for our struggles. And we are saying that this is not a task for COPAC, it is not a task for the SAFC, it's a task for all of us. It's a collective responsibility, it's a collective imperative. So tomorrow's conversation is to explore the modalities, the mechanics, the steps around this process, and to get your input to shape the strategic framework that we can all champion together. And then finally, uh, as Jane has said and I've mentioned, uh, we're going to take you into the VIT space tomorrow. We're going to get you to interact with the students. They've run a garden for four years, and Jane might say more about it in her input. And you're going to get to see the Food Sovereignty Center that we've secured at WITS as a space of dignity for the students, but it's also an ecocentric space. What we said to the university after giving them 8,000 signatures and marching, etc., and demanding what we've got, is that we want to show you the future. So we're busy fundraising at the moment to get solar panels, to get water harvesting technology, etc. And we're saying to the university, come and learn from this space what we are doing so that every building here transitions to solar. Every building here transitions to water harvesting. Every building transitions to zero waste, etc., etc. So you're going to be uh, interacting with a very important impulse and struggle at this university. Amandla. Yeah. And uh, I must say I feel a bit daunted being here, but I think I'm getting used to this whole atmosphere. Vish has really uh, laid down some, uh, his introduction has been quite uh, impactful for me. Um, coming from a um, religious background and more so from the Hindu background, um, for us, nature, um, the earth, water and also um, sustenance is one of the most important aspects of our belief patterns and as you know in terms of the, the Hindu diaspora it is all about being in tune with the Almighty and with nature and in terms of our prayers and our offerings it's all about sustenance and working towards the development and the maintenance of our earth. We are earth-based people because in our scripture and when we look at our creation, it is all about the sustenance of the mother earth. I'm just going to take you through and we say, 
uh, in terms of our scripture, we say uh, that means the atmosphere and the atmosp atmospheric region is our father. Prithivi Mata, that means Prithivi means the earth, that is our mother. And Aham Putra, that means I am the child of this life. So the whole universe, everything that we are, we are children of this universe. When we look at a historical perspective and we go back in time, many decades from the 50s onwards, coming back to um, our situation, pollution was responsible and is still responsible for deaths of thousands of people. Then we moved into the 60s and we said that mercury poisoning and contamination of seafoods and the disappearing, disappearance of different species in terms of nature, in terms of the bird life, in terms of the fish life. And this has been an ongoing process. Pesticides came into play and we also see the huge impact that it has had in terms of our environment. When we go back into the 60s, we see that oil spills and the, uh, the destruction of our sea and the, this has caused a huge problem in terms of that aspect of nature where we have our fish life and our destruction of the sea, the destruction of the bird life in, 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 in tune with, the, with the, the sea has been destroyed since the 60s and the movement of the super tankers in the ocean life, oceans. We also see that, that there is an increased degradation of the global environment. And this is, we are talking about it all the time, and this is about the greenhouse gases and the emissions that are taking place. Again, there is a big debate and conversation about this, and we are trying to bring awareness about this. Again, even in India at the moment, there's a huge debate on the, the large deforestation and the huge uh, scale of deforestation that is taking place and the huge impact that it is having in terms of the communities in that, in that part of the world. I think there are two other important things that, that also we need to look at and that is the, the balance of nature and in terms of noise pollution that is now increasing because it has a huge impact in terms of the natural resources that we have. So coming back to the Hindu viewpoint, and as I said that the earth is very dear to us, it is very special to us. In the performance of our rituals, we are always looking at the natural resources. When we perform our prayers and our, our offerings, in terms of our prayers, it's all about using natural ingredients. So I'm going to come back into our viewpoint in terms of the Vedic viewpoint. And we say that, may the heaven and the earth, working harmoniously, be clean and be at peace. And this scripture comes from the Atharva Veda. And it says that, may the great expanse of ether remain undisturbed by any extraneous matter. May the deep waters of the oceans remain clean and unruffled, and may the whole vegetable kingdom be free of impurities and be beneficial to all living beings. I've got the Sanskrit scripture, but I'm giving you the, the pure interpretation of it. We go further in one of our other scriptures from the Rig Veda, and it says that may the cooling, refreshing, and ever-glowing breezes be gently on us. May the sun also shine, undisturbed, so as to make us happy. May the rain clouds also thunder, so that their pleasant roar from time to time, prior to pouring their happy showers of rain. And thus, with the balanced natural phenomena, where we, meet, where, where we may ever live happily. Again, it's a prayer about the balance of resources and nature. It says, O Lord God, we beseech thee that the sun, 
the moon, the vital energy, the thermal energy, the water, the cereals, the herbs, the vegetables, the trees and plants which grow under human care and those that grow wild in the forest, all natural phenomena and natural products be conducive to our happiness, ever available to us. And by your grace, may you dawn on us. Again, that was from the Rig Veda. And as we go through these verses, it's all about the living and non-living components of our nature and our environment. <coughs> the functioning of the one affects the other. And there is an order, a definite law or system underlying through which both these are governed. And as we say, that these are God's laws. And nature is something that we need to preserve. Coming to my conclusion, we say in our beautiful passage that we normally chant for peace on earth, it goes like this. It says that may the heaven be the source of peace. May the atmosphere be undisturbed and bestow peace upon us. May the earth be a source of peace. And may the plants and medicinal herbs be pure and a source of removal of our troubles. May all the objects of be peaceful, and may the peace be peace. May may that peace be peaceful, and may this peace give us eternal peace all the time. I would just like to conclude in saying, with this last verse from the Atharva Ved, which says, "O oh Mother Earth, if I cause damage to you, please repair yourself and be green again." Thank you. Just send it around and you take me yourself. Um, if it goes out, just be like this. We greet you old ones. We greet everyone from prehistoric and unknown, mysterious times, all that are embodied in our evolution. We greet our ape-like ancestors, primitive mammals, reptiles, fish, primitive vertebrates, single cell organisms, and microbes. Further back, we greet crystals, and molecules, atoms, and subatomic particles. We greet our entire evolutionary heritage. We honor its spirit, and also the multifarious spirits in each one of us. Yes. <laughs> 
which is love and affection in a constant rebirth of all states, visible and invisible. Hallelujah! We greet creation and the creative impulse. Hallelujah! And thus, ancestors, ancestral multiverse, we beseech you in Earth Time 2018, redeem us from illogical thoughts about who we are and where we come from. Assist us to see that our most primitive and well-adapted ancestors are us. Make us see there are no lesser forms. Ancestors, assist us to fully incarnate our psychological birth imprint from Mother Earth and her forces. Assist us to comprehend the radical, practical implication of this. Assist us to comprehend the radical, practical implication of this. Assist us to settle for nothing less. Because by stealing from you, our ancestors, we will land ourselves in eternal disease for which there is no booty under the sun and stars. Bahulu. Bahulu. Restore the full dignity of our ancestral heritage. Tokozan. We have examined scriptures and we have spoken to ancestors and in a sense within the Christian tradition and within the Catholic tradition of which I'm part, we have both scriptures and ancestors, we call them saints. And today as a kind of reflection for you, I'm going to take you through a kind of meditation that is used often by monks, but also lay people, usually with scripture, but today I'm going to use something different. Back in the 1920s, there was a priest, a Jesuit, who was a paleontologist named Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. And Teilhard de Chardin was once excavating in the Ordos Desert in China. And it was a Sunday, and he was the only Christian in his group of scientists. And under the rules of the church at the time, he could not celebrate the Eucharist, because you needed, needed then at least one person to say the responses during the actual service. So he composed what has become called the Mass of the Universe. I'm going to read you extracts, and I invite you just to listen to the words. I warn you, his language is a bit strange, but it's stranger in the French, I'm told. Listen to it. And as you listen to it, try to see if there's a word <coughs> or a phrase that speaks to you. If necessary, if you're like me and your memory is not so brilliant, jot it down. So I'm going to start reading. Since, once again, Lord, I have neither bread, nor wine, nor altar, I will raise myself beyond these symbols, up to the pure majesty of the real itself. I, your priest, will make the whole earth my altar, and on it will offer you all the labors and sufferings of the world. Receive, O Lord, this all-embracing host, which your whole creation, moved by your magnetism, offers you at this dawn of a new day. This bread, our toil, is of itself, I know, but an immense fragmentation. 
This wine, our pain, is no more, I know, than a draught that dissolves. Yet in the very depths of this formless mass you have implanted, and this I am sure of, for I sense it, I desire, irresistible, hallowing, which makes us cry out, believer and unbeliever alike, Lord, make us one. Do you now, therefore, speaking through my lips, pronounce over this earthly travail your twofold effective word, the word without which all that our wisdom and our experience have built up must totter and crumble, the word through which all our most far-reaching speculations and our encounter with the universe are come together into a unity. Over every living thing which is to spring up, to grow, to flower, to ripen, during this day, say again the words, this is my body. And over every death force which waits in readiness to corrode, to wither, to cut down, speak again your commanding words which express the supreme mystery of faith, this is my blood. Rich with the sap of the world, I rise up towards the spirit whose garment is the magnificence of the material universe, but who smiles at me from far beyond all victories. And lost in the mystery of the flesh of God, I cannot tell which is the more radiant bliss, to have found the word and so be able to achieve the mastery of matter, or to have mastered matter and so be able to attain and submit to the light of God. Grant, Lord, that your descent into the universal species may not be for me just something loved and cherished, like the fruit of some philosophical speculation, but may become for me truly a real presence. Whether we like it or not, by power and by right, you are incarnate in the world, and we are all of us dependent upon you. But in fact, you are far and how far from being equally close to us all. We are all of us together carried in the one world womb, yet each of us is our own little microcosm in which the incarnation is wrought independently with degrees of intensity and shades that are incommunicable. And that is why in our prayer at the altar, we ask that the consecration may be brought about for us. If I firmly believe that everything around me is the body and the blood of the Word, then for me, and in one sense for me alone, is brought about that marvellous diaphony which causes the luminous warmth of a single life to be objectively discernible in and to shine forth from the depths of every event, every element. Whereas if unhappily my faith should flag, at once the light is quenched and everything becomes darkened, everything disintegrates. When Teilhard wrote this, it was because he couldn't celebrate the Christian Eucharist. In many ways, it reminds us, and I think it reminds religious people, that all our prayers and all our rituals are material, incarnated, infleshed, inworlded. I think we've lost that for a long time in many religious traditions, and I hope we are regaining it. Let us hope that we may draw upon all our traditions, and in doing that, strengthen our resolve to do what we need to do, to preserve and strengthen our earth. Amen. Amen.